This is Lindsay Clark, your primary instructor for Current Topics in Medical Laboratory Sciences. And today we have Lecture 29. This is the last of the Quality Control and Laboratory Statistics Lectures. I know you guys are excited. So, let's get started. The objectives for today's lecture are, number one, state the general rules to be applied when constructing a Levy-Jennings control chart. Number two, define shift, trend, random error, and dispersion, and discuss common causes of these problems. Number three, when given Levy-Jennings charts, correctly identify shifts, trends, random errors, or dispersion. Number four, state the purpose or function of the WestGuard multi rule system. Number five, when given control charts, determine which WestGuard rule is in violation, if any, and state the appropriate course of action. And number six, list the most common causes of systematic errors and random errors, and select those WestGuard rules that will detect each type of error. So a quick refresher of the last two lectures. So lecture 27 introduced us to quality control. What is it? Why do we do it? How do we do it? What tools do we use, etc. And then lecture 28 gave us basic knowledge of laboratory statistics, namely calculating mean, median, and mode, as well as standard deviation and coefficient of variation. So today in lecture 29, we are going to sort of put all this together. So we're going to talk about Levy-Jennings charts and WestGuard rules and how to interpret these and use them to monitor your QC. Quality control charts are charts that are used to record control results and detect QC problems. And they are a great visual representation of your QC data. And there are several different types of QC charts such as the cumulative summation limit, Yowden plots, and Levy-Jennings charts. The Levy-Jennings charts are by far the most commonly used QC charts in the clinical lab. And you can see there the image at the top is an example of a Yowden plot. It's kind of this strange little square um, plot. And below that is an example of a Levy-Jennings chart. So many of you will be familiar with this. So way back in 1931, a man named Dr. Walter Schuhart started using statistical-based control charts to monitor QC where he worked, which was the Bell Telephone Laboratories. And in 1950, S. Levy and E. R. Jennings took this and they adapted it for use in the clinical laboratory setting. So this is kind of how we came to have the Levy-Jennings chart. Now the Levy-Jennings chart, or sometimes called the LJ chart, looks similar to the one in this image. So the day of the month or the sample number is plotted on the x-axis, and the control values are plotted on the y-axis, and the mean and standard deviations are marked on the chart. Once the QC values are charted, lab scientists can use this to determine if their QC is in or out over a period of time. And in this image, you can see that Gaussian curve or the Gaussian curve there um, turned on its side. And this is kind of just a visual aid to help you see how that curve translates to this chart. So your mean is that darker black line in the center and your standard deviations are spaced equally from there. And you can see they line up with those standard deviations on the Gaussian curve. When making Levy-Jennings charts, you should always make separate charts for different test methodologies as well as different controls. So, for example, you want a chart for your normal controls and a chart for your abnormal controls. And the mean and standard deviations should be noted on your chart. And ideally, a minimum of 20 measurements should be used to calculate your mean and standard deviation. Now, the practice problem we're going to do today only has 10 data points um, because I didn't want this lecture to be two hours long. So you'll see here on this slide an image, and this image is a good example of a Levy-Jennings chart with control values plotted. Um, there's 28 days worth of data there. And you'll see this is control one for cholesterol. 
And when you look at this chart, the green line represents the mean. The yellow lines are plus and minus two standard deviations, and the red lines are plus and minus three standard deviations. So you want to look at that and sort of be able to quickly tell your mean is 200, plus two standard deviations is 208, plus three standard deviations is 212, minus two standard deviations is 192, and so on. So you want to be sure that you can interpret that um, on that chart. Now speaking of interpreting a Levy-Jennings chart, once you have your LJ chart done, you need to be able to look at it and figure out what it's telling you. So when you look at your LJ chart, the values should be pretty equally distributed. Now think back to your Gaussian curve and think about your plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations, and plus or minus three standard deviation ranges. And remember that approximately 65 to 68% of your values will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation. Then 95% of your values should fall within your plus or minus two standard deviations. And remember, that's what we consider your reference range or your confidence limits. You'll hear it called confidence limits. And then 99% or maybe a little more, 99% um, of your value should be within plus or minus three standard deviations. Now, if your controls fall within your plus or minus two standard deviations, your confidence ranges, then the run is considered in control and should be accepted. However, if one or more control values falls outside that two standard deviation range, that run is considered out of control. Now, if this happens, you should follow your lab's protocols to correct the situation. And in general, you'll need to hold patient results until the problem has been identified and resolved. Any procedural changes, anything like new reagents that are put on the, the analyzer, um, any of those must be noted on the chart. So what if we have QC errors? What does that look like? And what kind of errors can we even um, determine from looking at an LJ chart? So we can determine several kinds of errors, and that includes random errors, shifts, trends, and dispersions. Um, all of these can clue us into trouble that may be coming um, or may be starting. And a lot of times, if we're paying close attention, we can catch this before it becomes a major problem. So control values that suddenly fall outside of two standard deviations from the mean, that can be plus two or minus two standard deviations, when all your other control values fall within two standard deviations are considered random errors. So you can see here in this image, the blue dotted lines, that represents your plus two and minus two standard deviation range. Now the value that's circled in red is considered a random error, and you'll see that it's the only value that falls, without, uh, falls outside of that two standard deviation range where everything else falls within. You may see this once in about every 20 analyses or every 20 um, samples that you run. And this type of error can affect precision and reproducibility. So remember, if you have a random error, it's not likely to occur again on the next run. Now, what causes random errors? Well, that can include bubbles in your reagents or in your reagent lines, temperature variations, pipetting errors, and that can include instrument pipetting errors or um, laboratory scientist pipetting errors if you're maybe diluting a specimen and you pipette wrong. And it can include operator errors. So maybe you programmed something incorrectly on the analyzer and it resulted in a random error on that specimen. A shift is an abrupt change in control values where they suddenly fall on one side of the mean, either above or below. And it doesn't matter, um, but they all have to be above or all have to be below. Now this can be caused by changing the reagent lot number without recalibrating, using the wrong controls, 
or using outdated reagents or outdated controls. Now you can see in the images here to the left, the top one in the orange circle, those um, values represent a shift. And then in the bottom image, you have a green circle and all of those values represent your shift. And you'll notice they're all above um, the mean. A trend is a change that occurs slowly over time. So you can see the QC values gradually increasing here over a period of 10 days or so. So in the chart there to the right in the blue circle, um, over about 10 days, you just have those QC values gradually um, increasing. Now this is representative of a trend. So this may be caused by reagents that are starting to deteriorate or it could be caused by something like a diminishing light source or something that's kind of slowly um, going to change those results. A dispersion consists of erratic control results that are kind of all over the place. They're just not so equally distributed. So you can see in this image that there's a wide scattering of values. And this can be caused by system failure, operator error, etc. Now, if you notice any of these on your QC charts, you should take a closer look at your QC to make sure that it is acceptable. And just like everything in life, there are rules to follow for um, creating, interpreting LJ charts. So a little history, in 1981, Dr. James Westgard, who's pictured here, um, developed a multi-rule system for interpreting QC data. Now his rules are used to define specific performance limits for QC. If any of the rules are violated, then the run might be invalid and you should hold your patient results until you're able to further investigate. Some labs, probably most labs, don't use all the Westgard rules. And it sometimes is based on how many control levels you're running as well. So there are some different rules for when you run two levels of controls versus when you run three levels of controls. It is recommended that you use at least two rules, however, um, whatever lab you're in. And one of those rules should detect random errors and one should detect systematic errors. And you guys, I just want you to notice and appreciate Dr. Westgard's um, monogrammed shirt. I just love that he has a, a QC shirt. I think we all need a QC shirt. Okay, so what are these Westgard rules? Well, these are six commonly used rules for labs that routinely run um, two levels of controls. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. So the first rule, we have the 1-2-S. This is a warning rule. And it's a warning rule because you can potentially accept this run if there are no other violations. So for this rule, you will see one control value that's outside plus or minus two standard deviations. And again, if you have this violation, but there are no other violations, you can still accept this run. You just wanna keep a close eye on your QC for the next several days. Your 1-3-S rule. This will detect random errors and it will have one control value that falls outside plus or minus three standard deviations. If this happens, you need to reject your run. For your 2-2-S, this will detect a systematic error. This refers to two consecutive results that exceed the same plus two or minus two standard deviations. And in this instance, you're also going to reject your run. Your R4S detects random errors. And this states that the difference between the highest and lowest value, if that exceeds four standard deviations, this rule is in violation. Again, you're going to reject this run. Your 4-1S, it will detect systematic errors and it refers to four consecutive values that exceed plus one or minus one standard deviation limit. Once again, you're gonna reject the run. For your 10X rule, this will detect systematic errors. 
And this states that 10 consecutive control values that fall on the same side of the mean violate this rule, and you should reject the run. So this is a little chart here, um, but in a minute we're going to also have some um, visuals and how you would see that, how it would look on an LJ chart. But first, let's talk about the West Guard Rules flow chart. Um, so this is kind of a little flow chart that um, is supposed to help you interpret the rules and determine is your QC in, is your QC out, do you accept your run, do you reject your run. So you see you start there on the left with your control data. Now if you um, look at your data and look for a 1-2-S rule violation, if you do not have that rule violation, your warning rule, then your QC is considered in control and you can accept the run. Now if you do have your 1-2-S warning rule, um, you follow the arrow down, so yes you have that. Do you have any of the other um, rules that are violated? If you do not, again, you can accept your run, your QC is considered in control. If you do, however, have any of these um, other rules that are violated, your QC is considered out of control and you should reject your run. So let's see what these errors look like on an LJ chart. So the first one here to the left, your 1-2-S, your warning rule, um, that will be a value that is outside the plus or minus two standard deviation range. So you can see in that image, this is represented by the little yellow dot there, which is just above the yellow dashed line, which represents your plus two standard deviation. Now, if this was just outside your minus two standard deviation, this would still be considered a 1-2-S rule violation. To the right, we have the 1-3-S rule, and this is represented by the red dot. This is one control value that falls outside plus or minus three standard deviations. So you have the same thing here. This one is just below the minus three standard deviation. If it was just above the plus three standard deviation, it would still be a 1-3-S rule violation. The 2-2-S rule refers to two consecutive control values that fall outside plus or minus two standard deviations. So in the image on the left, this is represented by the two yellow dots, and you'll see they're both just above the plus two standard deviation. If one was above the plus two standard deviation and one was below the minus two standard deviation, that um, is a different rule violation. So you want to make sure that these are both on the same side. Um, they're either both plus two standard deviation or both um, outside of the minus two standard deviation. So the image on the right shows an R4S rule violation. Now this is where the highest value and lowest value are greater than four standard deviations apart. So the plotted points that are circled in red represent this value. Uh, sorry, this violation. And this is what I was talking about. So you can see here you've got one yellow point that is below minus two standard deviations and one that is just above the plus two standard deviations. Um, like I was saying, that is a different rule violation. That's an R4S rule violation because you have more than four standard deviations between those points. So here on the left, the 4-1-S rule is violated when four consecutive QC points fall either below or above one standard deviation. And this is depicted in the image here by the four values that are circled in red. You can see all four of those consecutive values fall just below minus one standard deviation. And lastly, we have the 10x rule. So this is shown in the image on the right. The violation occurs when 10 consecutive QC results fall above or below the mean. And so you can see those values circled in red. 
All of those values fall above the mean, and there are 10 of them. So that is a 10x rule violation. So now we know what to look for, but what do we do if we find an error? Well, this is where the West Guard rules flowchart comes in. So if the warning rule is violated, but no other rules are violated, remember we can accept the run. However, if any other rules are violated in conjunction with the warning rule, then your patient results should be held until the issue is investigated, identified, and resolved. And once your problem is resolved, patient samples from previous runs may need to be retested. Um, that is especially the case if you identify a systematic error. That has a much higher likelihood of affecting multiple samples than a random error. And any steps that you take to resolve any QC error should all be documented, and that should be done according to your lab's protocol. So let's work through an example. So this example problem is posted in Blackboard, so if you want to print it out and follow along, um, the blank problem is there for you to do so. So let's say we have a new lot number of sodium controls that have been put on the analyzer. The calibration was done, but we want to assess the QC for these controls. So we run a normal and abnormal control every day for 10 days, and we get these values here in the chart. So what steps do we take? Well, first we're going to take our data points and we're going to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, and the coefficient of variation. And we're going to do that for both the normal results and the abnormal control results. Next, we want to determine the ranges for your plus or minus one standard deviation, your plus or minus two standard deviation, and your plus or minus three standard deviation. Then we're going to label our Levy-Jennings chart um, with all of these values, and then we're going to plot all of our QC points. And then finally, we're going to look for any West Guard rule violations, and then we will determine if we accept or reject that QC run. So for this example problem, we're going to focus on the normal QC results. So if we calculate the mean standard deviation and coefficient of variation for the normal controls, we get a mean of 140, and I rounded that up just a little bit, um, a standard deviation of 3.47 milliequivalents per liter, and a CV of 2.48%. Now remember, you want your CV to be a, usually to be less than 5%. So here we have one, it's less than 5%, so that's pretty good. Now using this data, we can determine our normal control standard deviation ranges. So remember to do this, we are going to take our mean and we are going to subtract one standard deviation and add one standard deviation to get our plus or minus one standard deviation range. That gives us 136.5 to 143.5 milliequivalents per liter. For our plus or minus two standard deviation, we multiply our standard deviation times two, then we subtract that from the mean for our lower limit, add it to the mean for our upper limit, and that gives us 133 to 147. And we do the same for plus or minus three standard deviations. Multiply standard deviation times three, subtract that from the mean, add that to the mean, and that gives you your range of 130 to 150 milliequivalents per liter. And now some of these numbers have been rounded just a little bit, and that's okay. So our abnormal control data, that gives us a mean of 159, a standard deviation of 3.58 milliequivalents per liter, and a CV of 2.25%. So if we look, that's also less than 5%. It's fairly close to the CV of the normal control, and so that's good. And then once we have that, we can now calculate the abnormal control ranges as well. We do that in the same manner that we would do for the normal control. So 
So now that we have all those values calculated, we can begin to fill in our chart. So on this chart, the solid black line in the middle represents the mean, and our mean was 140. And the blue dashed line represents one standard deviation. The green dotted line is two standard deviations, and the blue dash and dot line is three standard deviations. And we can label all of these values on the y-axis. So the black, um, solid black line that is the mean, we can label that as 140. And then our plus one standard deviation is going to be 143.5. And our minus one standard deviation will be 136.5. So you can add those values to the chart. And you can do the same with your plus and minus two standard deviations and your plus and minus three standard deviations. Now the x-axis is already labeled on this chart with the days of the month. Um, sometimes this is also labeled with your sample number, your specimen number. So for this example, I actually plotted 20 days worth of data, but the first 10 days should match up to your practice problem data. Each dot here represents the normal QC value for that day. So for example, on day one, the normal QC value was 135. So that dot falls between minus one and minus two standard deviation. And on day two, the value was 142, which falls between the mean and plus one standard deviation. So you'll continue to chart all your normal QC values in this manner and your chart should end up um, like this for your first um, 10 data points there. Once all your values are charted, you want to take a look for any West Guard rule violations. So if we look at this one, we can determine that there are no West Guard rule violations, and thus we will accept this run. So all of that together is an example of how all this information and all these calculations would come together to help us monitor our QC, especially over a period of time. So you are going to have a homework assignment over QC and lab stats. I know you're all very excited. Um, and your homework is going to involve a problem that is very similar to this. And it will also have some basic questions about QC and lab stats. So make sure that you guys understand how to work this problem from start to finish. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me and let me know. Now, real quick, before we're done, I want um, to show you guys one more thing. And that is the West Guard website. So if you go to westguard.com and note that there's no U there, it's just W-E-S-T-G-A-R-D, um, this will land you on the Westguard QC website. Now this is the Dr. James Westguard, the founder of the Westguard Rules, um, and this website is full of great information and has some free tools. Specifically for this lecture, you can find on the website the West Guard rules, and it will go through all of them and has some very similar, um, I think I took uh, quite a few of those images from this website, so you'll see they're very similar or maybe the same images. And then you can also find some really helpful tools like a QC plotter. So if you click on QC tools on the left-hand side where the arrow is, That will take you to this page. And here you'll see a couple links at the top of the page. They are circled in orange. And there is a QC calculator, QC plotter, QC simulator, and QC checker. Now the simulator and the checker are only available, I believe you have to purchase a QC course, but the QC calculator and the QC plotter are free. So if you click on the QC plotter and once you get to this website, um, you can fill in all of your data here. So you just fill in all the little boxes. Um, if you don't want to fill in that top box with analyst, test, control material, so on, you can leave that blank. 
The next box where the control chart parameters are, if you fill in all of that data, and then enter your control data points, um, starting with number one, work your way up. Um, you can actually create a Levy Jennings chart, and this website will create that chart for you. That's actually where the chart came from that is on your practice problem, uh, the blank chart. I was able to um, build a blank chart for you guys, um, and the chart that's in the practice problem in uh, the PowerPoint that's filled in, that actually came from this website as well. So in that box where it has the control chart parameters, um, where it has you enter up to three control limits you wish to evaluate, if you just enter one, two, and three, and that's for one, two, and three standard deviations, that will give you your standard deviations. And then if you check the box for plot provided data points, um, then your chart will actually include all of the dots for your QC data points, just like the charts um, in the PowerPoint. Now this, along with the QC calculator, um, is a really great tool and is available to you for free. So I encourage all of you to play around with these tools, play around on this website, and I certainly encourage you to use this for your homework assignment. So if you have any questions about this website or any of the tools on this website, um, let me know. It's a really great resource for you guys, so I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. So as always, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please reach out to me and let me know. I'm happy to help you all. And here are the references for today's lecture.